So Delante, I'll tell you a little bit about Fictionary. It's yeah. uh, story editing software that writers and editors can use to um, edit their stories as they go. It was created by CEO Christina Stanley to edit her own fiction. Uh, hi, hi, Christina. Along with that, uh, a community has developed where we host events like this to talk to authors, um, to have webinars about different aspects of writing craft. They're now um, 1,500 people in the community shooting towards a couple thousand. So it's been a really lively, uh, fun forum for discussion. Um, I'll say for everyone here, um, we're hoping to have time for a couple questions at the end of the meeting. But if you have questions at any time, you know, this will be an open, friendly discussion. So pop them into chat and um, Pictionary Zone uh, Shane will, you know, break in if, if uh, at, at times and we, we can take questions whenever. So uh, Delancey, thank, thank you so much for being here. Um, is there uh, anything you'd like to tell us about yourself that you've missed, that I missed? Uh, what are you working on? What do you have coming out? Um, sort of a state of state of the union. Um, well, to address the Charlie Taco issue, that is a direct result of having two boys. Um, we we got a pandemic puppy about well, obviously about two years ago, three years ago now, um, and we could not decide what to name him. Uh, the, his real name is something like Monsignor Charleston. Chacostixon or something and then they added taco on the end so we just call him Charlie Taco and kind of ignore the rest <laughs> so honestly we call him Char Charlie most of the time but he is my office mate slash writing buddy because he just sort of hangs out with me um I I have a full-time job as well so I work from home and he's just the guy that's always around because the kids are in school and the husband is off doing whatever husbands do um that sounded really awful. <laughs> He's at work. <laughs> we understand. Doing appropriate things. Um, and what you asked what I'm working on, um, always a million things. I just actually finished and am publishing in the next, when does it come out? The 28th, the next Casper Ridge book comes out. So that one is called Only a Touch. It's the one that follows the book, Only a Secret, that we'll be talking about today. So that's book four in that series. And then I'm also just this morning wrote my first chapter on a co-written book. Um, I co-write with one of my best writing pals, Marika Ray. And we do, um, well, in the past we've done sweet, uh, silly rom-com, small town. And this is going to be our first not sweet, um, in other words, steamy small town rom-com series that we're going to do together because we just had an idea that writing with her is kind of um getting to let yourself run free a little bit you know where if I've written myself into a series where I have to follow certain conventions but if I ever have a crazy idea I call Marika and she's always like okay <laughs> well uh Casper Ridge I know that the the tagline is uh hot fighter pilots in the small mountain town so that's a nice little teaser for later as well <laughs> I'm not um, good at taglines. <laughs> no, I love it. It's great. <laughs> um, but you, you, you know, you write. You have your day job. If anyone looks at your bio, you've been successful in a lot of different areas. Um, you know, it brings uh, uh, it brings up. I always think you you have your own um, editing business where you you do author coaching, um, uh, other aspects of editing. Uh, it's evident ink, um, but. You know, for the writers in the community, one of the questions is always, um, how do you, how do you find time to write? And you know, you're you're one of the you're one of those people that anytime I talk to you, I always think you might have some magical ability to stop the clock because you do so much all the time. And what what are what are some insights there on how you balance these different aspects of your life? I don't I don't know that I have any helpful insights. That's honestly the question that I get most often. And so I've been trying to think of a really good answer for it um, because I don't, I would love to tell you that I'm, I'm shortchanging some other area of my life, but honestly, I think it must just be a mindset thing. I just accept that this is what I do. Um, and so, you know, I work out three or four times a week. I go to my kids wrestling matches. I, we have family dinner every night. I, it's not like I'm, you know, and I, I take weekends off mostly. So I, I don't really know. I do get up early. 
Um, so my writing time is before my day job begins and I usually edit at night and on the weekends. So I guess that doesn't really feel like work though. That's, that's what I do. So it's more just finding, I guess, the times in your life when you want to work on specific types of things, um, so that it doesn't feel like you're working all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great, that's a great thing. Um, I guess somewhat along with that, uh, we know that romance sells a lot, a lot of publishers, um, you know, it, it funds the bottom line of a lot of publishers, uh, romance readers have a voracious appetite. We'll read as much as a book a day sometimes. Um, but along with that, uh, comes a lot of pressure from, uh, for romance authors to, uh, to deliver and put out a lot of content and to publish a lot of books, a lot of series. So what's, um, that's a, that's a big challenge. And how do you, what do you, what do you say to authors or, or to yourself to, you know, to make that seem a little less daunting? Well, that's a good question because that's the one thing I, I kind of harass myself about if there is anything is that there is a lot of pressure to publish more. And I know I'm always in this chicken and egg or kind of paradoxical situation because I would love to not have a day job. I would love to write full time, but I, the money I make writing uh, plus editing is not enough to um, replace what I make in my day job. So, um, and my day job is very related. I'm a writer. I work in, I am a brand strategist and managing editor for a small marketing firm. So I basically help companies tell stories, uh, which I enjoy. So it's also, you know, I'm not dying to leave the day job, although it would be nice. Um, but I've worked long enough and I'm old enough that that's a significant income at this point and replacing it every year gets a little bigger, you know, the, the hurdle raises. Um, and so I, I do constantly think, gosh, if I could just double my publishing output, I could probably leave the job. But in order to do that, I would really probably hate my life. Um, and, and I wouldn't enjoy the writing. And the whole point is that I enjoy writing. So I, I think the way I've decided to look at it is that, yes, if you, if you want to make a big income fast, you have to publish a lot if you're indie. And that's not going to be my goal. Um, so instead, I want to enjoy writing. I'm in the lucky position of not having to, to rely on that income. So I look at it as something that I really love doing. And if magically the Lucy score fairy comes and blesses me one day and, and I get to enjoy that kind of success, I'd be thrilled, but um, it is what it is right now. And I suggest to other writers who feel that pressure to figure out why it is that they're writing, what their objectives are and how can they publish in a way that honors that intention. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic answer. And it's often just really nice to know that, you know, in the writing community, everyone's in this together, you know, so few people can, you know, write and fully support themselves in that way. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a common struggle, but, you know, loving what you do, sure, sure helps. Um, and, um, uh, uh, so a, a bit more of a, a, a fun question is the, um, uh, the book we're going to be looking at uh, is described as a using the uh, age gap and grumpy sunshine uh, tropes and uh, grumpy sunshine, especially a lot of fun. Um, and, it, you know, it makes me think about uh, contrast and why why do people love these contrasts so much when it comes to our romance characters? a good question. I, I think you just made me realize that Grumpy Sunshine and Age Gap are both just variations on opposites attract. And that's probably the heart of it. Um, you know, romance hinges deeply around tropes. So, and they also provide a kind of a structure um, for the writing itself, because there are certain scenes that will obviously happen in certain types of tropes. Um, as far as why readers seem to gravitate towards, especially the grumpy sunshine thing is huge right now. Um, I think it's, it's like, gosh, I'm not gonna be very articulate here, but the romance readers at least like to see the grumpy man and 
They have said that they want, in fact, Marika and I were just talking about this. Readers have told us that they want to see role reversal. They want to see the grumpy heroine and the sunshiny man, but they don't, they don't. Because we've seen it happen a couple of times and it's not very successful. And what I think they really want is to see, you know, the, at least for MF, male, female romance, to see the, you know, grumpy hero who's maybe given up on love, who, you know, has decided that, you know, it's not for him or, you know, whatever it is, he would talk like that, I guess. I don't know. But, um, and then to see just someone so miraculously, amazingly brilliant and sunshiny pop into his life that he just can't even help but fall in love with her. And she pulls him out of that darkness and shows him how much fun they can have. And so it's, I think it's a redemption arc, really. And everybody loves a good redemption arc. Well, and that's very much along the lines of always keeping in mind that you have to, when you're writing romance, you have to always center the romance. And um, in um, the Casper Rich novel we're going to be looking at, there's a really fun subplot involving a treasure, treasure hunt. Oh. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, you know, in terms of, it's very easy for a writer to, you know, you know, get off track and pursue a subplot to the detriment of, you know, lo lo lose the focus of, you know, romance that. So how do you, how do you balance your subplots when you're, when you're writing so that you never get too far away from the romance? Um, I try it. Well, I, I think the way I did it here, and I, I, you could argue that I did get a little carried away um, or that the subplot was strictly a means for me to be able to employ the word booty regularly. Um, <laughs> I find amusing. But yes. um, it's the nothing way wrong. I did it. What's that? I said nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> um, the way I did it was to ensure that every hero, at least, um, because it's all centered around this resort, right? Casper Ridge is this um, old dilapidated ski resort in Colorado. And the way that the book, the first book begins is... Um, an, an uncle has died and his nephew, he leaves this old dilapidated resort. And it turns out that the nephew has a sister. And so together they kind of grew up in their summers at this place. And so it has um, what the sentimental appeal and they decide to go back and resurrect this resort and make it better than it ever was. But um, their uncle also left them a I can't remember how it all started. I think a poem that led to an actual map. And so the first couple of books were easy because that was a big part of the plot. But then as I've gotten further down the line, I have realized two things. One, you should figure out if you're going to have a romantic, or I mean a treasure hunt subplot, you should figure the treasure hunt out ahead of time completely. Like understand what the treasure is and where it will be found and all of that, uh, which I was not wise enough to do. Um, but I do know things now that I didn't know before. Um, and then secondly, keep all the characters fundamental to that subplot. So in each book, the hero or the heroine is closely related to Ghost, who is the, the nephew who began the treasure hunt. And they all have both emotional and practical reasons for wanting him to succeed. And so they are willing to help him go through this crazy hunt. I do, I have had the feeling that I've sort of subconsciously pulled the pieces apart a little bit more in the, the later books. It's not as integral to the plot as it was, um, but I think it's okay. <laughs> no fixing it now. <laughs> one, of, one of the fun parts uh, to those books too is that because the fighter pilot angle, there are a lot of fun call signs. So there's oh, ghosts. Well, my and husband's stuff. call sign was pork chop. So <laughs> I, uh, the first years of my marriage was hanging out with guys named monkey and Yeti and creature and all kinds of things. So I was like, this is fun. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to work with this. Well, I think now we're going to, uh, I think Shane's going to bring up the first scene in Fictionary. And Delancey, so this is what Fictionary looks like. You uh, import your manuscript and you can edit scene by scene. And you see there are uh, 38 um, scene elements that you can address by character, plot, and setting. Um, and the software also will automatically pull out the major plot points. So uh, inciting incident, plot point one, midpoint, plot point two, and climax. 
uh, using a kind of AI function. Oh, um, this is terrifying. Is this going to highlight mistakes and like no. <laughs> all the places <laughs> I've gone wrong? <laughs> yeah. Pixgary gives you visual insights and guardrails so that um, you can address things like um, it, it helps you assess your, your uh, uh, writing for revision. So if you look at something like, you know, one, you have a, a character list, um, you can bring out insights for, you know, characters by chapter, characters by scene, when characters enter the story. So just a lot of cool visual uh, insights and checks on, you know, your, does the, do I have a good POV goal in this scene or that, that kind of thing that you fill in as you go to, you know, give you a constant reminder because it's hard to keep track of all of those elements at one time um, when you're when you're writing and you're so you know you're also an author's always so close to something that it's it's hard to um, to see that themselves. So this just gives you a lot of sort of rails to operate within. Um, this is, sorry, can I ask a question about it? Does yeah, it course. create like um, a story bible, or is there somewhere that it keeps track of like all the characters and when they enter in the timeline and all that kind of stuff? Oh, you're all nodding. That's so cool. Yeah, there are uh, visual insights that give you, there's a story map. So a lot of it is um, like in developmental editing, a lot of developmental ed editors will uh, create like giant Excel spreadsheet or some other kind of spreadsheet to track all these different kind of elements. Um, and then yeah, you can see like word count per scene, um, that kind of thing, um, scenes per chapter. Um, and then the story map lets you um, pick any of these elements and select to compare element by element so you can see where it helps you see where for instance like tension is flagging if there you know there's there's been no clear POV goal for four chapters so I think maybe tension is flagging there or pacing is flagging so it has a lot of a lot of cool insights um but I was going to I was going to ask you about because setting is one of our options here and it just gives you a check on things like, you know, have I, have I, you know, are there, are there sounds and smells, all the sensory sort of objects, if the, you know, is this, is, is the setting for this scene, does that have the most emotional impact, or could I maybe look at something else, but, you know, setting is such an important thing in romance, and, and you know, small towns or, or, you know, a mountain setting, um, and, you know, you do a good job of, like, immediately establishing that here, so, you know, what is it about um, setting and specifically sort of small towns that appeals so much to uh, romance readers? I think it is the ability to, to insert yourself emotionally into a cast of characters that are familiar and who tend to reappear. Most small town um, romances are in series. And I think that readers just sort of fall in love with the, both the location, the it's, I'm American. So it's hard for me to say whether the small towns that I write and read appeal to small town residents or small town, you know, lovers um, from other places. But I feel like regardless of the nationality or setting in that way you're you're getting a found family you're getting especially with rom-com which i write there's always the opportunity to build in you know the little the crazy townspeople the quirky side characters and the readers that i get feedback from often i get the most feedback about those quirky side characters or the crazy stray cat that shows up every time or you know stuff like that um and i think keeping a, a longer series anchored in a small place allows for a lot of that interplay and connection between books and characters. Yeah, and this scene is uh, so great because it, um, when I read it, I really had the feeling of arriving at the resort and meeting all these kind of cool, interesting people that I felt like I would get to know better over the course of the story. And you know, you also, there's a nice little ending hook where uh, Harrison is worried about, um, you know, what happened at his last, um, his last teaching gig, but you do a, you know, do a nice job of, you know, with, withholding a little bit of information from the reader there. So it's, you know, you set that little bit of intrigue there. 
And um, that's always important, isn't it? Like, it's a really difficult thing to do, isn't it? To know what to reveal when, or, you know, you're, you're trying to establish so much in the opening, but also not give away too much. Yeah, I think it, it's something that I learned over time and probably still have much to learn. And in 10 years, I'll, I'll tell you about that. But one of the big things that helped me learn was editing, um, just kind of intuitively seeing in, in lots and lots of books what was working and what wasn't. And then slowly, I, I'm not a fast learner. Um, my way of bumbling through life is making the same mistake two or three times and then finally realizing what I'm, what I'm doing wrong. Um, and so I think all of that reading experience, you know, not passive reading, but having to read actively and make suggestions um, and try to identify problems really helped me kind of troubleshoot my own craft. And so I'm, I'm mu getting much better at that. Uh, I certainly think there's, there's always room for improvement, <laughs> but yes, my goal is always to leave, to give the reader a reason to turn the page, to, to make them think, oh, okay, just one more chapter. Um, before they put the book down. Yeah, that's we we talk about that a lot. Where you know, reading the next sentence, the next paragraph, the next scene, the next chapter, the next book. Um, right. So, well, I think so, that, is, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I think one of the quickest ways, you know, and especially now with such a glut of um, fiction available, and unfortunately, I just read this morning that. Amazon is being flooded with AI generated um, fiction, wow. which is not good um, no. for us <laughs> because no. sometimes if it's well packaged, readers won't know the difference. And with so much competition, um, you know, I'm one of the offenders who, if I'm not swept up into a book within the first three chapters, maybe sometimes even the first few pages. I'll just yeah. put it down and move on because why would I read a book that I'm not enjoying when I have so many other options? And mm -hmm. I think about that a lot when I'm writing. Um, the last, you know, if, if I give someone all the information up front, why, why in the world would they turn the page? Yeah, and you, you also see a lot though that people, um, you know, recommend getting that because, because of the, the, you know, the 10% the or whatever the sample is on Amazon now, it's, you know, get that inciting incident or get that meet cute and romance as, as close to the beginning as possible too. Um, I know that uh, we are coming toward the end here. So um, if there are, uh, Shane, do we have any questions from the audience? Or if anyone would like to raise their hand, if they have a, a question for Delancey? We have none yet. You guys aren't usually shy. So ask some questions. I'll make up answers if I can. <laughs> I have a question. Oh, Christina, go. I want to go back to the beginning of how do you find, I know you talked about this a bit, but creative energy takes a lot of brain power. And so when I work creatively at work, I'm done and I don't have any anything left in my brain to do any creative writing later in the day. And I'm I'm wondering how do you, I don't know, time box, the creative part that you can Get act earlier, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like your creative brain wants to work early because I'm done by like 2 p.m. Honestly, with any kind of writing. OK, yeah, you know, and maybe that's that's the solution that um, I don't know, like I just find that after a day of working, I got nothing when I sit down and think, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's it. No I often can't write at night. Um, the only way that ever happens is if I'm reading and it's often in a co-written book, I'll read a, a Marika chapter and then be like, oh, and I'll just want to get back into it. Um, but at night, I don't usually feel that way at all. Instead, I, I sort of subscribe to the belief that my subconscious brain works on all the creative stuff while I sleep because I'll read what I wrote the, the day before, before I go to bed. I don't actively think about it, but I think my brain does something because when I get up in the morning, I just, I don't really awake. I just yeah. do the thing Work. and sometimes <laughs> it turns out okay. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Okay, so Kathy asks, what is your process for mapping out a series? 
<laughs> this assumes that I have a process. Um, <laughs> in some ways I do. I, I have a spreadsheet. Um, I always start with, um, you know, kind of mine are always found families, bound, bands of brothers. Um, because I'm writing romance and because I write in series, I need some kind of natural group of eligible usually bachelors who I can throw at heroines. So, you know, a fighter squadron was a good, uh, but I didn't want to write them in the military. So I had to kind of figure that one out. Um, so I'll do a lot of thinking about that kind of thing. Like who, who are these guys going to be? I've done a soccer team. I've done other small towns where they're just townspeople or I like big families. Um, so you figure that out. And then I decide on tropes. You know, I do a lot of market research to find out what's popular right now, what's selling, Enemies to Lovers is always good. Grumpy Sunshine is usually good right now. Um, so I'll try to then think about, okay, so what's a, what, what would be happening with these guys I've come up with, what the setting that I'm kind of interested in that could work with this trope. And then, and so I'll start kind of just making a spreadsheet of, you know, okay, book one, whichever one I'm most hot about, whichever trope I'm most excited to write, that will be book one. And then I just kind of <clears throat> go from there. <laughs> Awesome. And then a quick one from Kaylin. What is your method for taking a trope and making it fresh or new? Um, well, like I said, uh, sometimes I'll try to flip genders, but that doesn't often appeal to readers, even though they say that's what they want. So I try to, gosh, I've even taught a class about doing this. And to be honest, I don't feel like I have a great answer right now. Um, I try to make something a little bit unexpected. Um, and often it is gender roles because I don't like seeing the woman always being the baker or the woman always being the nurse, you know, so I'll make a male nurse or I'll make, you know, the, in the book, I just finished the fighter pilot bakes a wedding cake. Um, so I don't know. I think I, it's, I don't know that I make the tropes, especially fresh or new, but I try to make my characters a little bit more well-rounded so that they fill the tropes in a different way. Awesome. Nice. And then one final question from Natalie. How or what do you do for market research? Oh, well, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot. Um, the easy question or the easy answer is Amazon. Um, I am starting to move all my books back into Kindle Unlimited, which makes market research a little bit easier. But uh, there's a great resource called Kalytics if you write on Amazon and even just for the market in general, um, you, you can find out kind of what's hot in each category and that helps with keywords. It helps with um, knowing what tropes to use and how your covers should look. Really, I just look at top 100 lists, what's selling right now and how fast do I think I can write and can I get something into this hot moving trend or do I need to look at more evergreen stuff? Um, there's a lot to it. I'd be happy to, to chat with you about that at some other point if you ever oh, want to look for me uh, editing or something. Yeah, definitely. I second Kalytics. It's fantastic. I use it all the time. Yes. Yeah. Well, and that brings us to the uh, top of the half hour. And uh, thank you so much for coming. We're going to be back on uh, March 22nd with another Seen It First episode with thriller author Rio Ewers, who's a fantastic author. He's also done uh, graphic adaptations of Stephen King on King books. So that's something to look forward to. I know I can't wait. And Lancey, thank you so much for being here. You provided a ton of great insights. And I think thank everyone was really happy to be able to meet you tonight. Yeah, please feel free to reach out on Facebook or my website or however, if you have other questions or just want to say hi. Thanks, James, for inviting me. Thank you for oh, sharing. Thank you so much for being for coming. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. And I hope everyone has a great evening.